I think the biggest challenge for me was even though on the surface it might look like you know the culture and language because like right now we're speaking English, right? And even though we sound different the way we speak English, we're speaking, you know, the, a, a shared language. And But when you get to uni, there's like a whole other way of using English that I wasn't really prepared for. Uh, Malo Lele, everyone. Uh, hey, it's a blessing to have um, one of uh, the emerging scholars in the field, uh, not just an indigenous, but also in anthropology, ethnomusicology, uh, and just a, our good old mate. And uh, Dr. Dan Hernandez, lovely to have you here, man. And uh, yeah, thank you again for taking the time out of your busy schedule to um, share some of your ideas and, and, and insights in regards to what your everyday life looks like as an Indigenous PhD scholar. So, uh, uh, yeah, from the get-go, if you can in- kindly introduce yourself, um, where you're from, and then we'll go from there. All right. Um, kia ora, malo. Thanks, Edmund. Um, so I was uh, born in Los Angeles, California, um, but most of my life uh, I was raised in the west side of Salt Lake City in a neighborhood called Rose Park. And... Um, uh, was there for most of my life, and then uh, later on, uh, married um, a Pakeha woman from Kirikiriroa, and have been living here in Tamaki Makoto for the last almost eight years now. Um, my Foka Papa is back to Ishimule or Guatemala, and I have a, a variety of different lineages that I come from there, um, including Kiche, Kachiker, Sotohile Mam, or broadly known as the Mayan people um, in Guatemala. But because I was raised in Utah, um, uh, and within a Mormon community, a lot of my interactions were with the Pacific communities there, and in particular Tongans and Samoans. And so, um, someone who has indigenous roots to Central America, um, but raised uh, further up on Turtle Island, mm. um, but then hanging out with Islanders, I've kind of have this, I guess, global indigenous kind of experience. And I sometimes joke that I'm a Mayan hanging out on a, a Tongan sea vessel. So I'm a Mayan voyager on a Tongan canoe. <laughs> Amazing. Um, you'll probably get asked, and, and I'm pretty sure you've been asked over, over the years. Um, your if you can share some of you, you know, your first first experiences with with our Tongan communities, and and pretty much how has that led to you becoming the person that you are today, and and researching in the field um, with our Tongan peoples and communities. Yeah. Um, so. Maybe it's not a surprise. Like my first interaction was in church, <laughs> so, uh, and that's a you know a, a big thing for for Tongans. Um, I've learned like when I first did, I, I didn't realize how big church was until you know I finally was able to travel to Tonga many years ago now, and I've made several trips and uh, seen the communities here as well as in, in the states. Um, but for me, that's how it started, and um, that was I guess the church. But there was also like growing up in what we would call the hood or the working class communities, there was that element as well. And mm-hmm. so we had these multiple, I guess, overlaps where, you know, go to church together. Um, we're in a working class community. Um, so I had kind of the neighborhood, similar neighborhood experiences. Um, now I wasn't the greatest athlete, but I enjoyed playing U.S. football. And so that was another site as well where it was um, really developed further relationships with the Pacific folks that were playing um, as well. And of course, a lot of them got taller than me and, <laughs> went on to play <laughs> university level and um, I had to find something else to do and, and, and thinking was something I could do even if I w- didn't have the height. And so <laughs> um, that's kind of, I guess, the the base of my everyday kind of experiences with Pacific folks. Um, and yeah, at uni, I was I'm a first generation um, university student, didn't really know what to expect, what to do. You know, my parents... Um, kind of similar to other immigrant stories and diaspora stories of, you know, uh, either displacement or other hardships. And, you know, they, they always emphasize the importance of education. Um, and for me, you know, that meant a lot of stuff. It, it didn't just mean getting a degree, but it also meant get, having this, taking advantage of as many experiences as possible. So mm. as many different kind of cultural realms that I could tap into were, was part of my education. And then um, while I was at university, uh, at the University of Utah, um, there was a, a professor that showed up uh, in the anthropology department who was, I think, the first person who was 
not of a European background, wasn't white, and um, he was mixed uh, European and Tongan. And he, he ran a field school. His name is Dr. Adrian Bell. And he, he was starting a field school in Tonga. And he's like, hey, you know, do you want to come do some research in Tonga with me? And I never thought to, like, take these experiences that I had growing up in the communities that I was in, um, I guess, seriously in the academic sense. Mm-hmm. I always took them seriously as far as relationships go, but never thought about it academically. And then that kind of opened me up to that. Went to Tonga back in, oh, man. 2012 for the first time, and we went across the various kind of major island groups, Tongatapu, Hapai, and, and, and Vava'u, and it really opened up uh, my world big time. Um, and I realized that all the stuff that I had learned really helped me, but that there was so much more as well. Like there was just all kinds of different versions of Tongan experience and Tongan knowledge and rich history, um, and that, that really kind of... Um, I guess, yeah, building off of those everyday experiences that I never thought were going to turn into an academic mm. uh, kind of career um, or even, you know, like my professional skills, you know, like on one hand, I study it. But then on the other hand, the stuff I was learning in communities like the generosity that I would say Pacific folks have a very unique expression of generosity. Mm. My people are generous, too, but we have a different way of doing it. Mm. Um, and the way that the communities share, like for me, those are important lessons for me. That I that became part of my life, and that even though I'm in like this academic professional setting, um, that to me is part of the life skills and social skills that I bring to the work. So on one hand, I do I guess formal research. Mm. On the other hand, there's also the life lessons that I've learned, um, and learning how to live with other people, share um, in 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 ways that I think have really benefited me in the, mm. in the long run. Um, before we we talk further about uh, education and also. Uh, Tongan people. Uh, quick fire. Fair Tongan food? Oh, man, that's tough. Uh, I was going to say it depends because I'm going to cop out because it depends on where it's at and where I'm getting it from. But I will say, I'll say uh, May is one of my top. If I, Like fried May when I had that in hot pie, man. And, and even like lolo y feke. And man. May in English is? Oh, uh, breadfruit. Breadfruit. So some fried breadfruit. Some uh, uh, octopus cooked in coconut, man. That that's one of my top favorite Tongan drink. Oh, Otai, Otai, easy by far. <laughs> and uh, and favorite favorite island. Oh, that's you can get me in trouble, man. Yeah. <laughs> this doesn't get me in trouble. Depends on which one I'm at or who I'm hanging out yeah, with. Yeah, that's right. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Wherever island you're from, <laughs> that's my favorite. That's a good answer. Good answer. <laughs> hey, going back to the education side, mate. Um, just just wondering if you can share some of your um, some of the challenges um, that you faced as an indigenous person um, entering mainstream university. Oh man, there is heaps. I think the the one of the I guess the the easiest way to put it is the I think the biggest challenge for me was even though on the surface it might look like you know the culture and language because like right now we're speaking English, right? And even though we sound different the way we speak English, we're speaking, you know, the, a, a shared language. And but when you get to uni, there's like a whole other way of using English that I wasn't really prepared for. There is a whole other culture and expectations as well that I wasn't really um, uh, prepared for either. As much as, you know, love my parents and their sacrifice and everything they did to help me prepare. But um, because they hadn't gone through a university experience, particularly in the U.S. or even in New Zealand, um, there was just some stuff that they weren't able to kind of give me, you know, preparation for. And, and I actually dropped out of university the first time I went. I ended up serving a, a Mormon mission. Um, instead and doing that. And then I came back and I got back to a different unit, ended up dropping out <laughs> um, as well. And then, you know, got married. Long story short, I, I did what's, I guess, equivalent of a uni tech here. Mm. Uh, we call them community colleges in the U.S. Mm. And it was smaller, and smaller classes um, and more intimate. And I was able to find, uh, it was easier for me to to succeed there. Um, when I went to the big university at front, that's why I dropped out at two of two big ones. I just, it was big and it was scary. I didn't feel like I could do it. Um, and I didn't have any points of reference or, or, and maybe the biggest thing too, I just didn't have the confidence to ask questions or to, 
you know, make mistakes. I was super nervous. Um, but I did do, I got married and started life and that kind of helped as well. I got my degree at a community college or uni tech equivalent. And that kind of helped me build enough confidence to realize, okay, there's, um, when I don't know something I can ask or I can go look for it. And I think that's where I also got along a lot with the Pacific folks too. You know, we sit in the back, you don't want to get in the way, you want to be humble. And I think that's really important life skills. Um, however, at university settings, like if you come in that way, it's it's not made for you, right? It's right. it's made with a different moral compass or a different value system. Yeah. And so you have to tap into something else um, to be able to speak up and to have confidence. And that was the other thing too, even though, again, my culture background is slightly different, we have a similar way of approaching elders. And I think that was the thing, you know, I was at uni and people are asking questions or, or even challenging professors. And I was like, I was never going to challenge somebody that I looked at as having higher authority. Um, and I had to learn how to do that. And um, in the end, I kind of, I do it in my own way because I don't do it in the exact way that I saw it happening, but I do it in my own way. That's kind of a mix. I, I would think of different sets of values and backgrounds, but but yeah, those are the, that's a big challenge. It's well, still a challenge. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you've, you've just mentioned your, you know, through experience of dropping out of two high education institutions. What inspired you to come back then? And then, you know, now you have a PhD. Yeah. Man, I look back far out. Like, I, I can't even imagine that I'm at where I'm at now. Like, I I think initially my ma- my my major motivation and drive was to honor my parents. Mm and their sacrifice. And as hard as it was, they, you know, they were always like, this is, you got to take advantage of an opportunity here um, that they didn't have access to. Um, And I know both of my parents had desires to go to university, but um, the circumstances that led to, you know, them leaving Guatemala was in the middle of a civil war, all kinds of kind of social instability as well, economic challenges. Um, You know, they just ended up not being able to. And so, um, I think for me, that was one of the big ones. That's why I kept coming back. Mm. <laughs> and then when I got uh, married and, and had a couple of kids, um, they weren't old enough to really grasp it yet. They were mm. young, but I realized, okay, you know, I, I didn't have to move to another country sure. and learn another language and a whole other society. I grew up in that society and it was still hard for me to move out of that society into like higher education I was like, I got to sacrifice something. I've got to do something for my kids mm. to be able to look at. And I think going in, yeah, you know, I was always told, you know, go to uni, you get a better job. And so I went in that thinking that way. Mm. And eventually, you know, a combination of, you know, parents and my partner and my kids all motivated me and just finding ways. And it took me a long time. It probably took me seven years to get my undergrad degree. Mm. I got my master's and my PhD faster than I did my undergrad because once I learned the culture and I was able to survive it and to find ways to navigate it, um, I was able to be more successful for my postgrad. Even the postgrad's harder. It was way more intense. But I was I had better knowledge of how to move through that system. And then my motivations changed where I wanted to get a better job initially. And then later I was like, oh, man, this is bigger than a job for me. It's now I want to learn about everything I can as much as I can. I want to learn how to learn, how to find stuff, how to, and even if I end up working, you know, whatever, end up, you know, I got to do what I got to do to, you know, help support my family. But, you know, if, if for some reason, worst case scenario, I end up, you know, doing whatever kind of job I have to, like the knowledge that I have doesn't ever go away. Yeah. And so I can always teach my kids and um, show them, hey, it's important to read, it's important to research, it's important to think about where to find your sources, it's important to think critically, all that kind of stuff. So, now my motivation is more around kind of um, just learning as much as I can about everything and giving my kids and community and anyone have access to as much access to to that as possible. Uh, real, real briefly, if you can share some uh, uh, some insights into your PhD topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I did my PhD research on Kava and um, Kava or, you know, the Western scientific name is Piper Methysticum. Um, it's it's huge. It's big. Like it's hard for me to talk about it now because after doing research, I realize how how big it is and how complex it is. And but for me, I was first introduced to it um, as a teenager. Uh, some of the boys um, 
would would participate in their local kalapu or 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 you know either village or family kava club or they would have it in part of their everyday life rituals whether it was you know a, a putu or a funeral or 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 some other life event so i was kind of aware of it and and i tried it once um while i was a teenager and then i have a relative of mine who uh served in the marines mm. and in his unit were other tongans and they actually drank kava while they were stationed um at, at their military base and then they ended up getting deployed mm. um and and having a tour and then coming back and so for them kava was first how they got together and had built a sense of camaraderie in their military unit uh and then it was kind of something to prepare them as they went into to battle and then when they got back it was something that helped them kind of deal with and cope with the consequences of of having to be in such a traumatic uh situation like a war zone and that's when i kind of really got into it cuz he was coming back from his deployment and i was about to graduate high school and he brought me in um and i got exposed to i think two different kinds of kava um both were super interesting to me um one was kind of this big setting kind of a kalapu setting where a lot of different people come mm. from a variety of different backgrounds and you come together and you drink kava and there was a lot of joking a lot of comedy a lot of roasting um a lot of debate as well people were debating about sports and and current issues um and then shortly after i was exposed to another setting of kava which is much smaller it wasn't a kalapu setting it was in a family home just a few different people um and some elders and that one was was very rich as well and it was uh because it was smaller it was a lot more focused on the discussion and really listening to kind of the knowledge and experience of of the elders who were there um and their insights and of course there's a little bit of comedy and different yeah. things as well but it was it, it was a, a it was very intellectual and i was just really taken back of how how much i kept thinking about the stuff that we were talking about even after that so that was my first exposures to it and then i ended up like i mentioned earlier going to tonga and doing some research and um and that was uh kind of opened me up to thinking about okay what are the different ways in which people are using kava and i was just an undergrad at the time um and um dr bell who i went with does a lot of stuff around kind of evolutionary theory and community groups and how people learn through groups and so i was kind of under that umbrella at the time and and just uh, more survey based just kind of talking to a lot of people going to as many kava settings as mm -hmm. i could and getting a taste of all this different stuff and then when it came to my phd I kind of went somewhere in between my early experiences and that later one and um I wanted to explore um what kava meant today particularly for groups that are outside of the kingdom of Tonga who are changing in their practices because they're born and raised somewhere else similar to me um because they're doing more pan pacific groups mm. uh, or multi ethnic groups or even multi gendered groups a lot of the groups early on that I was in were mostly just men um but i was finding that especially with you know the next generation and youth groups is a lot more mixing uh, of genders happening and that was something unique particularly for tongans and i was super interested in that uh, but then also the music and i don't speak tongan fluently i'm still learning it and studying the language as much as i can and so i've only done a couple of tongan songs that i've looked at where i've had help from people who know way more than i do um but i was looking at kind of the songs that were written in english so a lot of reggae mm. um even some hip hop songs that people were telling their stories about kava and i was kind of trying to think about that and pay attention to that and how so while i was in doing this research there's a lot written about kava but a lot of it is about the really elite ceremonies yeah. and a lot of it is the older practices and even today the very elite practices and it's super fascinating i love that stuff but i was interested in what most people were doing right which weren't being there wasn't a lot of literature on them your work was huge for me there because you were talking about those five kava groups um and then i was also looking at aporosa and and the work that he was doing and that he roped me into um and that kind of opened me up and he's doing a lot of stuff with the fijians and even beyond the fijian communities uh and so for me the music was an opportunity to say what do people what have people been documenting themselves mm. you know by writing these songs and telling their own stories about what kava is I wanted to take that stuff seriously and kind of put them together as much as possible to say say hey here are some different themes and stories that that people are talking about as far as how why this is important today to these communities and I'm focused on that because right now Kava is exploding mm. um beyond the Pacific right you have 
um, supplements being used. You have uh, kava lounges, rooms, and bars throughout the world popping up from Thailand to across the U.S. Mm -hmm. to Europe through even here. Um, and so I, I really wanted to to take a to capture a moment it, that all these things are changing, and I wanted to you know kind of re record and pay attention to the recordings that people from the community themselves have been saying on, hey, this is what kava is to us right now, mm. and you know it's likely going to keep changing. Mm. But at least we have a point of reference for for that those stories as well. Mm. Um, Ferret NFL team. Oh, I grew up with the Denver Broncos, so the Salt Lake is close to Denver, so it's the closest NFL team because of Mormonism in Utah. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's not a lot of support for Sunday <laughs> activities, and the NFL plays on Sunday, yeah. so I was always watching and supporting the Denver Broncos, but. Most of my family were Raiders fans, and so there was a little there bit of tension go. at times. There you go. <laughs> Ferris, uh, favorite baseball team? Oh, man. Uh, I don't really follow baseball a whole lot, but I'll say uh, the Chicago White Sox, just because I do have some family in the south side of Chicago, and yeah. that's the the White Sox side of town. So, And, and your favorite takeaway take, uh, take in, in America? Oh. Right now, I'm going to say – uh, Mexican, just because I miss Mexican food. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no surprises there, mate. No surprises. <laughs> yeah. Hey, just going back to um, to as as a Guatemalan man, um, and then entering uh, the Tongan community. What what has the what was the reception like? Mm. Did the how did the Tongans um, take you on board, and you know, whether they welcomed you as a as one of their own or yeah, can you share some of that? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think overwhelmingly, uh, incredibly generous. And, and I think overall that's been my experience with, with, with Tongans is, um, incredibly generous people. Um, that doesn't mean there hasn't been moments of debate or, or issues for sure, but that was more so on the academic side of things. As far as in community, I've never had any issues personally. Everyone's been very warm and receptive. I think sometimes it raises questions mm -hmm. Um, but it depends on which community we're talking about. Like in the U.S., it might be sometimes people will be like, "Oh, is what is this guy?" They'd be like, "Is he is he is he a really short Tongan or <laughs> is he Samoan? Is he Hawaiian? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is this dude Mexican? Is he Navajo?" Like I get all kinds of stuff like that. And um, but then when I was in Tonga, it was totally different. They're like, "Oh, where's this guy from? Is this guy from Hapai? Is this guy from Vavao?" Yeah, like yeah, it just yeah. depended. Because it was so many different ways of looking Tongan. And some people would look at me and, what is it called? Like the the Mata Kupesi, right? They're yeah. trying to figure out whose family are you part of? And they look at me and like, because I look familiar, but not familiar enough. Sure. And so I had that. And then they'd be like, oh, where does this guy fit? You know? And so, uh, but then they were there and sometimes be like, oh, I have a friend who would introduce me. I um, mean, he'd kind of explain and then everyone would be like, oh, Intiakula. So Red Indian or American Indian. Sure. Um, uh, and then here... It kind of is different, right? We're in the biggest Polynesian city in the world. People might be like, oh, maybe he's Tongan or maybe he's Samoan. If I'm in the Southland, they're like, oh, you Maori? You know, <laughs> not a lot of brown people down there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it really depends on where I'm at, I think, and how people perceive me. But the reception has always been incredibly warm. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes people are surprised that I know something. I would never say I'm an expert on Tongan stuff because all my knowledge comes from Tongan people. And I have more of that. Um, um, there's more people, people have forgotten more about Tongan knowledge than I will learn still in my life. And yeah. so I'll, I'll, I'll happily call myself a Tongan nerd or a nerd about Tongan stuff. Um, because I, I I'm fascinated in it. I love it. And it's become a big part of my life. Um, but I've always got so much more to learn. Yeah. And I think that reception has always been big academically at times. There has been some moments where people are like, Hey, you know, as a non-Tongan, why are you doing this yeah. stuff? And I had to just be straight up and be like, you know, I came in and um, I was first gen student and I wasn't planning on doing this kind of research initially. Mm. There was an opportunity that arose that allowed me to make connections to my experience with Tongans. And then I got entangled in it. And once I got in it, I was in it mm. and, and I couldn't just leave it. I had to finish it out and, and I'm in it forever now. And um, I've got nieces and nephews now who are also Tongan. Mm. So even in there's some. You know, my uh, Tongans out there right. now too, and and you know, in extent in my larger kind of kainga or kinship group, and so yeah, it's, there have been moments sometimes people ask questions. I think those are fair questions. Mm. Um, that's why I say what I do, just because I'm like, yeah, there's always someone who will know more about this or that, and that's right. fair enough, you know. 
That's it's that's, that's good. Uh, you know, just a friendly reminder to those out there. We are known as the Friendly Island. So if you don't know now, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just just going back to um, you know, uh, as a as a non as a non Tongan as a non Pacific entering Pacific spaces, what would you encourage or what would you say to to our non non Pacific colleagues, mm-hmm. particularly in research, who want to enter these spaces? Uh, some advice that you'll give to them to yeah. kind of better engage or find better skills to better engage with our people. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I think one, um, be humble, um, you know, and enter the space similarly. Like I, I'll give a fight cover example. Like, um, now not everybody's like this, right? So I'm not trying to say that everyone's like this all the time, but I've observed many, many times people who will come into a fight cover space that maybe is new to them. Maybe they're visiting somebody else's space, sure. um, and they're tonguing themselves, right? And uh, or maybe they're visiting for for a life event or whatever. And in most of these cases, um, you know, I've, I've observed, you know, these mates of uh, of mine and ours that you know come in and and are just very humble and are actively listening and paying attention. And it's kind of that again, sitting in the back of the room. There's 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 a there's a logic to that, right? You're you're paying attention to what's going on. You're reading the room and you're trying to pay attention and listen to who's related to who if you don't know. You're trying to figure out where you fit and how you fit. And I think there's a there's a strong sense of humility in that practice that I really love and appreciate. And I think in order to honor that, it's good to, and I know that not all Pacific spaces are the same, but um, in general, I think that's a good practice. You come in in a humble way mm. and and you you listen, you learn, you you wait for invitations. I mean, for me, again, the academic research was you know through invitation by another Tongan, and then I just kind of kept building and building. And then a lot of my work now, I don't, I haven't published anything that hasn't been with other Tongans that's about Tongan stuff because for me, that that's always been collaborative, and so that continues to be the case. Um, and I think if you don't got the social skills to 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 work or to to go the distance, then be patient and, and maybe slow your roll, take a step back and then see where where it is, if it's appropriate or not, um, you know, with those kinds of things. And what I mean by that is like you down to eat the same food together, you know, are you going to eat what somebody, you know, brings to you? Sure. Uh, are you going to share what you have? Um, I've never been with Pacific people generally that haven't, you know, always offer whatever they have. Mm. And it's not just food. It could be the material stuff and like are giving up and sacrificing and everybody's giving mm. uh, in that regard. And now sometimes I think it's taken advantage of, especially with people outside the space that come in. And I have observed that throughout my research and it can be very, it, it upsets me a lot when I see that happening because that generosity works when, because it's in a system where everyone's gifting back and forth. But once it enters into where you're being generous and gifting, and someone else isn't, then what ends up happening is they exploit that. Mm. And there there isn't that same kind of long-term um, ongoing gifting. And and that isn't just to individuals. I'll give one other brief example. Like there was one thing that I did. Is, it was just part of my job. I was in, back in Utah. I won't give too many details. But like it was just part of my job. And it ended up helping out a family that um, to me, I was just like, oh, I was just doing my job. But like I, you know, was letting them know, hey, there's this service available, you know, might as well, you know, come and use it and made that connection. Um, and I didn't think about it. But then years later, uh, when I ended up in Tonga, this family um, remembered that I had helped out their family and they had communicated. And then they were gifting stuff to me in gratitude for what I had done, um, which ultimately was just doing my job and, and and sharing the networks that people have done with me as well and helping people fill certain paperwork out and that kind of stuff um, and, and getting stuff that is available that should be able to be used. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't even directly given, right? Like I, that was it and that was all goods, but then I didn't even think about it. But for them, like that memory remained and they shared that with their family. And then when I ended up in Tonga, their relatives and even extended relatives you know, found me to give me um, gifts and, and koloa and things to to say thank you mm. for that. And so, again, it's a complex system of gifting where, you know, even with us, right? Like, if you ever wanted to go visit Guatemala, I don't live there right now, but I'd be like, hey, you go stay with my family, sure. right? And so it's these broad kinship groups of relationships that exist. And I think that's, um, that's, it's big. And if you don't get it, 
you know, be patient yeah. and learn and and take your time. But I think there's a there's a lot of lessons for the world today around the world that um, I think the Pacific has to offer that I hope that more people will take seriously. Yeah, no, that, that's that's on point. You know, if you uh, if you're tuning in uh, and you want to enter research with our Pacific peoples, some good advice here from Dr. Hernandez: be kind, be humble. Um, learn and also be patient and also let's summarize it let's just be human um, and if you can't do that then uh, come sit around a carvel ball with me and I'm more than happy to teach you what that looks like uh, favorite publication that you've done so far oh man you're always trying to get me in trouble yeah um, uh, whichever one I'm currently working on is my I guess my diplomatic answer but I will say the the one that I feel really great about um and it's not the greatest work. Um, it was a, a documentary film. And the reason I like it is I, I'm i not the greatest writer. I've learned how to write through academia and I'm getting better still so I can do it. And I, I, and I, and I, and I, I'm learning to enjoy it and appreciate it as well. But um, I made this documentary film um, called Kava Roots, um, spelled with a Z at the end. And um, I'm not the greatest filmmaker either. I learned a lot of stuff. Afterwards, when I was like, oh, I should have looked at this. I should have done this angle. I should have recorded longer. I mean, there's so much stuff that I that I could have made it. So it isn't, isn't the prettiest. It's not as pretty as it should be. But the reason why I like it so much is because it has so many voices and people can hear and see people directly. Um, because when I'm writing stuff and even when I'm writing with, with others, there's great work there. And I love doing that stuff. Um, but – you know, with academic articles, there's there's agendas, right? We have to make an argument. We have to make a point. We have to demonstrate how we're making that point. Uh, and, and that's going to be filtered through through who, the people who are writing it. And um, what I liked about this one is it just kind of opened up a lot of different voices to be heard kind of directly. Mm. Um, and even then, as an editor, like, I can't deny that it's being filtered through, you know, different things as well as, as me kind of selecting, okay, uh, this is really great, but the sound isn't good enough or or this is great. Um, but where am I going to cut it or, you know, that kind of stuff. And so, I, you know, it is being filtered through. Um, but I think that's one that I, I, it's one that I'll go back to it. And it does make me emotional watching it because sure. all the memories come back, you know, sure. all these different mixes that I've had with people, uh, these memories and, and, and just seeing the people in it, you know, because you develop, I mean, for anybody who watches it, I think they'll get something out of it and, and a, hopefully a very complex, diverse picture to Kava because there's so much there. Um, but for me, it just, it's just the memories of, oh, the, the things that these people have done for me and the experience that I've had together with them. I think that's one thing that, hmm. you know, because it's easier for me to watch it than to go read the other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I, I watch more than I read, even as an academic <laughs> today. So, <laughs> and, and with your, with your, uh, with your approval, uh, we'll put the link together with this podcast. Um, out there for for people who who would want to see the video and also uh, some of the work that you're doing in, in academia. So we'll put some publications on there as well for people to read um, and, and showcase that as well. Hey, we're coming to near near the end, but if you can explain uh, what a normal nine to five looks like for you as an indigenous scholar, oh, what does it what does it look like for you a normal nine to five? I would say uh, it looks one way during the semester and it looks another way off the semester in between. Um, but I've got four kids, and so that's a big part of it. Um, and my partner is amazing because she, she didn't leave me when I was writing the PhD. When <laughs> There was certainly some moments that um, she became a solo mom. And um, uh, it was, it's, it's, you know, her name should be on there, you know, as much as mine is. And... Um, but that's a big part of my everyday life. So, uh, you know, whether I, I've got classes that I'm teaching or, or meetings that I'm going to um, or whether I'm working from home in between semester and, you know, getting classes prepared or, you know, editing or writing or whatever, um, it it's always moving in and out of family life. And for me, um, that that's a big part of my life. And so, you know, uh, my kids have kind of grown up with me as a Ph.D. student. And uh, there's times that I wouldn't sleep, but then they'd be waking me up in the morning. Uh, I know a lot of people didn't like Frozen because of the song got stuck in the, you know their heads because their kids were singing it. That wasn't the issue for me. The thing with Frozen was, I think there was a scene. If I, I don't even know if I remember it right, but of like, you want to build a snowman or whatever, and like she goes to wake up the sibling, and I think she like opens up the eyelids or something. I can't remember. Anyways, 
my girl would do that to me. She'd wake me up in the morning and like opening up my eyelids and was like, do you want to go build a snowman? And I'm like, I hate this movie so bad right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've got memories of holding my kids while I'm typing, um, you know, taking them to Faikava's with me as well. And that's one thing that I love about doing Racing with the Pacific is it's, it's family friendly. Mm. And, um, and, and sometimes things would adjust if I had kids there. But the fact that that I could, you know, allowed me to do the research as well. Because as a family person, it's hard to do research, mm. and um, uh, you know, that's part of my everyday, you know. But I will uh, mention one other thing is just because my wife will will probably want to make sure to emphasize this whenever she does. And she's like, "Are you going to a meeting or are you just having a fight call?" <laughs> and so I'm like, "No, this is a meeting. We're actually getting work yeah, done." Yeah. <laughs> but we do incorporate fight call on campus quite a bit, and that's been ever since I've been here, and I love that. Um, because uh, it, it just adds another dynamic to to our um, you know meetings, or we do get stuff done, but it's nice to have the bowl around and yeah, yeah. you know uh, throw in some jokes while we get some work done. Yeah. Uh, last couple of questions, bro. If you look right down this camera here, <laughs> and um, you mentioned earlier your motivation um, are your parents. Mm. Um, in one minute, if you can share. Um, like you're right down on your camera and believe that your parents are looking right back at right back at you. What would you say to them um, and acknowledge the way that and the sacrifices that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, um, I would just say thank you uh, and thank you for being patient <laughs> with me with my ups and downs. Um, thank you for for the lessons um, for for being there for me. I grew up in a in a rough neighborhood and, and I, I've got friends in all kinds of walks of life and I've been in all kinds of places. And I think the ultimate difference for me was there was moments where I was on that tightrope of <laughs> what direction my, I might end up. And, and it was, it was my parents who, who were, were kind of my, my grounding, my roots um, that gave me options of, of doing things in a different way. And so I would just say, you know, muchísimas gracias. Thank you. I love you guys. Awesome. Me, Herod, Dr. Dano Hernandez, sharing his life, his experience, uh, and a diary of his uh, of a PhD scholar of, of uh, indigenous background. Mate, thank you so much for sharing your your insights, your your ideas, um, your experience, uh, and some words of encouragement for those who want to enter Pacific spaces, um, and that you may continue the good work that you're doing. Um, I don't have a gift for you, but I'm pretty sure as the friendly islands, the people we are, uh, we've got nothing to say but thank you. Uh, and that's the only gift we can give back to you. And uh, I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, you continue the good work that you're doing for our students, our communities and our people uh, that you continue to serve and care for. So other than that, mate, thank you so much. Look forward to um, catching up again and, uh, yeah, bring on podcast number two. Kia ora, let's go.